welcome to another episode of the DC Comics Chronicles podcast and vidcast. As always, I'm your host, Adam, and with me is my co-host, Donnie, the Emerald Enthusiast. Donnie? Hey, what's up, DC fans? It's the man whose ring runs on fanboy energy, the podcasting machine, the big nerd in green. It is the Emerald Enthusiast, and we are here to provide you, just like tea on a hot summer's night, provide you with refreshment in podcast form. This is the DC Comics Chronicles. Yeah, but not the tea that these, like, scoopers say they've got tea, you know, like... I mean, the, first of all, that terminology is ridiculous. I mean, you may have the actual tea in your cup, but... Water. Is there actually... It's all in water, okay. <laughs> it's a shame. It would have gone well with the, with the, with the, the motif. But yeah, we're worth it. we don't talk about tea in that, in that kind of sense, because every time Grace Randolph talks about tea, it's like, that's the worst-tasting tea I've ever, I've ever drank. <laughs> If your scoops are anything to go by, uh, but anyway, um, that's neither here nor there. And not uh, Granny's peach tea either. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't want any of that. No, no, no. <laughs> Definitely. Oh my god. <laughs> but you know, there are certain scenes that I just say why, and that's one of them. <laughs> that and the no one stays good in this world flying away as he looks constipated. That's just <laughs> not what Superman would say in my opinion. But anyway, I'm not going to go on a rant. We're not here for that. Um, yeah. Unless it's a comic book rant, which I may go on because it's appropriate. Sure. Uh, and I actually will go on a little bit of one because I'm a little frustrated. Um, but so I, I just want to announce that um, since DC <coughs> altered its the way it distributes to the mm-hmm. local comic shops, they've, they've gone through this lunar or whatever. What is it called? Lunar? I now, believe so. Yeah. yeah, they're not with they're not with um, Diamond anymore. Diamond anymore, no. Um, ever since they've gone to this format, my comic book shop is constantly getting DC books late. Like they come whenever the hell if they feel like, basically, uh, to the point where if I rely solely on physical. We wouldn't be able to record these podcasts because I wouldn't have the books in time. Yeah. So, as much as I wanted to keep, you know, a handful of DC books on my physical pull list, I have now had to. I, I've been sort of DC. DC's shipping, or, or Luna, or whoever's responsible, has forced my hand to now only having on my pull list two physical DC books. The rest, look, I'm still paying for them via Comixology. Of course, yeah. But I only have two DC books on my pull list now, being Action Comics and Detective Comics, because those were the ones that I've been collecting the longest. It's unfortunate that the reason why was not because I wanted to give up a bunch of buying a bunch of DC physical books, but because... The delays are so frustrating, and I was forced to, in theory, when I actually got the physical copies, double dip because I didn't have my books. So I had to buy them digitally. So mm-hmm. now I just said, screw it. The rest of my DC books are all going digital. Yeah. That's uh, understandable. I'll still be supporting Green Lantern, The Flash, Batman, Superman, all via Comixology. And Quite frankly, one of the main reasons I'm leaving two DC books, I mean, there are a couple other books that aren't DC mm-hmm. that are on my physical list, and to give a shout out to those publishers and, and those, those people who are on those titles, I'm going to be uh, still physically collecting Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ongoing, because uh, mm-hmm. those, those turtles in a half shell, I love those guys. Uh, uh, the Masters of the Universe Revelation uh, prequel comic, uh, uh, Mighty Morphin, and Power Rangers. So those are the those are the ones that are on and Spawn. Mm-hmm. So those will be on my, my because Todd McFarlane's Canadian and you know got to support my <laughs> uh, and I, because I like Spawn as well, not just because sure. he's Canadian, right? You know, you know but um, but so those are the ones that are going to be on my pull list. And uh, thank you, you guys for not screwing around with your shipping policies and ship it to my local comic book shop one time. All right. 
you know, the, but basically, the reason why I'm keeping those DC books on is because I've been collecting them the longest. Okay. And, I, and because I love Batman and Superman. Those are literally those are the only two reasons I'm keeping them on. Because well, you don't need to worry to... about buying the, not buying the Green Lantern physical copies because I'm buying enough for both of us. Yeah, well, and I figure <laughs> I don't think Jeff Thorne would mind because as long as I'm paying for the book, yeah, you know that's supporting. Yeah. Uh, and last I checked, physical or, or digital sales count towards oh, the yeah. success of a book. Yeah. So, but it's just been a frustrating uh, few weeks. Like I've gone literally three weeks without any books. I, I can understand your frustration, definitely. Uh, so, uh, and, and my comic book owner is, is frustrated. And that's an, another reason why I wanted to keep a few books physical to, of course, support my, my local comic book shop. But he's frustrated, I'm frustrated, and it's just, it's chaos. But in saying that, uh, I still read the books digitally so that we could produce the show. And the books that we're going to tell the... Uh, Tell the audience which books we're going to do, and then we'll go into each one specifically. But tell them the four books that we're going to do, and then we'll, we'll go into them as. You're going to see us cover Detective Comics 1035, Detective Comics 1036, Action Comics 1030, and Action Comics 1031. Indeed. Um, and we are going to start with Detective Comics, because that's what... Uh, Donnie had up on his screen uh, with the creative team and everybody else involved. <laughs> and so yeah. that's the one we're starting with. Um, there's no rhyme or reason. But we are going to, what I thought we would do, just it's a little bit of a change from our norm. We're going to do the DC Comics Chronicles and we're going to basically organize our reviews based on, you know, family of titles, categories, if you mm -hmm. will. Or, so we're going to do Batman and Superman related episodes, which will comprise of either uh, will comprise a combination of detective action, and then another Batman and Superman related episode that will cover the Superman and Batman related issues. Then we're going to have a Justice League component where you'll see us cover, you know, Justice League and um, you know uh, maybe Justice League and Superman Batman because it's more of a team book, uh, and then. Flash, Angry and Lantern, we will do separately on those two separate shows. Mm -hmm. So that's how we're going to yes. organize our our uh, our reviewing. And if we do do Supergirl by Tom King, I don't know if you're interested in covering that at some point, Donnie. Oh, sure. If we, if yeah. we do do that, that would be on the one of the Superman, one sure. of these shows. Mm -hmm. So, But that just came out, and I haven't had a chance to digitally buy that yet, but I will at some point. Um, because there's a lot of interest swirling around Supergirl lately, and you'll mm -hmm. hear more about that Yeah. next week when we do the Flash of Two Mics episode. Because, right. yes, Supergirl has something to do with the Flash, and we'll talk, talk all about that next yes. week. But for right now, Donnie, take it away with our first issue. Okay, our first issue, Creative Team, and I will do my best to get these names right. As always, if you happen to see this and you're one of these people, I'm sorry if I mangle your name. I'm doing and my if best. you're wondering why I'm stupidly smiling, it's because I enjoy watching Donnie Shrubble. He forces me to do this. Oh. <laughs> okay, Jordi Belair on colors, Aditya <laughs> Bidikar on letters, Lee Bermejo, the variant cover, Mariko Tamaki, the writer, and Dan Mora, the art and cover. That was perfect. I mean, well done. Man. I hope so. Did my best. Well done. So, Detective Comics 1035. Wow, that's a huge number. It is. Yeah. I just say 1035 now because it's a lot of words I don't have the energy to spot out. Uh... <laughs> so, Detective Comics 1035. The opening scene, we see that a girl named, a young woman, excuse me, Sarah Worth has been kidnapped. She is part of the Worth family. Kudos on the name, by the way. I think that How works perfectly. How much are they worth? That's the question. <laughs> uh, a lot, judging by the way their father dresses. And also, you know who else would really like that name? The Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. I just thought I'd throw that, yeah. <laughs> he'd, he'd appreciate that, yeah. Oh, 
So the worst are among the Gotham elite, as you might expect. And Batman, who is still dealing with the anti-cape sentiment in Gotham, goes looking for her, and he finds her dead body tied up in the sewer. That's kind of the opening part of this comic. What did you think of that, Adam? It's really shocking visual. Uh, and the art is striking, just like the, the detail, the atmosphere of Batman going through the through the sewers. I mean, that's on everybody, the colorist, the, the artist, you know, uh, to, to make that look so evocative, so powerful. I mean, that, everybody on that art team has a hand in that. Right. And it's just like, like Batman skulking and, and doing detectiving, is that even a word? Uh, in the sewer is quite a thing. I think a, probably uh, just detecting, I'm guessing. Okay, yeah. <laughs> You're right. I just made up a word unnecessarily. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, it was a beautiful shot and also gruesome at the same time. Yes, yeah. But they didn't. They didn't go too far with it. Yeah, you don't, it wasn't. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't. It, it wasn't so gruesome that, like, you know, a, a young teenager couldn't read this or a ten year old couldn't read this. So well, I've seen other disturbing imagery on on Twitter the last couple of days regarding. Yes, I would say so too. Regarding Batman, and it's just like, come on. Ah, oh, okay. Well, oh, man, the things that came across my timeline, I blocked a lot of people this week because you know what? Show you know, a little. Show a little restraint, people. Unfortunately, I think Zack Snyder's was the worst one so far. And I don't mean to say that because I want to crap on Zack Snyder. Because uh, if you go back, you, you know that I, I love Man of Steel. Mm -hmm. BVS is solid, and I really like Zack Snyder's Justice League. But that image was unnecessary. Uh, yeah, there there were a lot. There was a lot of that this week. I, I again, I could just do that. One was that was just the, personally the, the worst one that I, the most graphic one that I saw. Right, and we're not we're not going to get into what we're talking about here. But if you were on Twitter, no. you know about a certain yeah. hashtag, and yeah, there were. Yeah. yeah, again, people show a little bit of restraint. You know, these are characters that are beloved by children. And I, th and I thought the penguin was perverted, but I, the Twitter proved me. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know the penguin in Batman Returns. I thought yes. Oh yeah, I remember. <laughs> but but Twitter Twitter proved me. No no, you think hold my beer. Twi Twitter collective fanboy Twitter co collectively said, oh you think he's perverted? Hold my beer. <laughs> oh, so back to the story here. Roland Worth, Mr. Yeah. Worth, who is actually on the cover here, is absolutely incensed over his daughter's death. Understandably so. Of course, yeah, yeah. But the way he is presented is that villainy will be the norm for this character. He's huge, he's overbearing, he's privileged, he's loud, and he looks like he's ready to blow a gasket at every moment. You know, uh, yeah, big yeah. bulging eyes, and just, he conveys anger. Yeah. So, yeah, I really like how, I really like how this character is drawn. He's very imposing. Yeah. You're right, he does have the, he's got that air of, of you know, like old money, uh, aristocracy. Yeah. But also, he looks like a brawler that could just like, destroy you. Yeah, yeah. Kind of in the same line, but like you know, some something like the kingpin, something like yeah, that. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. The kingpin with a hair and a mustache. Right. <laughs> so we see that some some kind of chemical agent or something of that nature is raising the rage level in Gotham. And of course, I had to look around for a red ring. Didn't see it. No atrocities. But that's just me. So I, I'm not surprised that you scoured the pages for a red ring. <laughs> just, just in case. Just in case. You know, is there a little angry cat running around or whatever? You know, spreading red rings. You just never know. Listen, so, that's going to bring up Catwoman, and then, then that discussion. No, is let's not go there. <laughs> I was talking about Dexter. Let's you know. Back I know, but cat, <laughs> cat, you said. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, so another thing we see that Bruce is actually walking home one night and Sarah, seemingly Sarah, kind of shambles out of the shadows and this is kind of a zombie version and Bruce sees her and of course, course is mortified because this is a young woman who's supposed to be dead. Right. So then the second part of this issue focuses on Huntress, who we see By her... By the way, that was very like, eerie. That was very eerie, the way... I liked it, yeah. The way, the way she 
a peer that is like, you know, he's you know, fumbling with the keys mm-hmm. uh, you know, to try and get into his brownstone. By the way, thank you. See, Tom King, this is all your fault because if Alfred was still alive, you wouldn't have to fumble for the keys. Alfred <laughs> would be there to open the damn door. <laughs> so, you know, there, I just want to throw that out there. Okay. Um, see, Al- now, Stephen, Alfred's got a reason in the comics for not being able to open the door or get Bruce's food because he's dead. Mm. Where's our cupcakes? You right. don't have that same excuse. Yeah, I want my, want my pumpkin muffin. Yeah. All right. But, so um, it was a very eerie, creepy image. And I, like, not to spoil things too early, but it had a, a very dirty, clay kind of vibe happening. <laughs> right. So if you think this is a Walking Dead crossover, not quite. It, it's going it to make sense. It kind of reminded me, yeah, like yeah. her image kind of looked like, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought. I thought that, you know, she had been like reanimated in some way. But yeah. again, we, we get an explanation in the next issue. Yeah, so, so you were saying Huntress? Yeah. Okay, so the second part of this issue focuses on Huntress, who rescues a woman named Mary Knox. Now, Mary goes on nighttime walks with her cat, because she has suffered trauma at the hands of a former lover. So she and Huntress, who, you know, Huntress does her anti-hero business at night. Yeah. They strike up a friendship. And about, I believe it was three weeks after that, Mary is mur- Mary is murdered. And Huntress takes in the cat and vows to track down Mary's killer. Uh, yeah, no, I what, I, what I really enjoyed about this, um, <clears throat> this, you know, backup story was sort of you know the exploration of Huntress admitting that she's not really a people person. You know, she yeah. doesn't do well on teams. She doesn't have many friends. But I like how this this uh, Mary mm-hmm. character, yeah, she kind of took a liking to her. You know, and. Like you see where like every page where Mary was you know babbling on and on and hundreds of years like, but she kind as she says in she kind of got used to it and yeah. they developed a friendship and then mm-hmm. unfortunately was you know ripped away from as we'll see later you know ripped away from her. I I kind of like that Huntress was able to develop that because it, you know like if you you look at Huntress's backstory with her family being murdered by the mafia in front of her and, and all that kind of jazz. She's had it rough, so to have her kind of slowly grow and, and develop a friendship with someone, it was, was as briefly as it lasted, was kind of nice. Uh, but also, you know, just puts her through the ringer to have to go through the pain of losing somebody that she opened up to. Uh, it kind of underscores why she doesn't open up. Right. And I, w- I will stress this here. That part of the story ties into... The, the the former the main part of this comic in the next issue yeah so. yeah um, I do really like see I'm of kind of two I'm of two minds of uh, in regards to the huntress mm-hmm. in the sense that my preferred version of the character is the Helena Wayne version. Okay. Because um, I like the, the fact that she is Batman's and Catwoman's daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that legacy aspect of it appeals to me, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, there was that Birds of Prey show from 2002, if you remember. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was a, that, what, one season. Yeah. One season that I really enjoyed. Yeah. It was canceled uh, far too soon. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I just want to say that uh, take this opportunity. Uh, to say that all three women uh, on that show, <laughs> but especially Ashley Scott, who played Huntress, aka Helena Wayne, aka Helena Kyle, mm-hmm. is definitely on the list. Now, was she? The, I, I there, just had to do that. Uh, that's that's fully understandable. Was she the one who was in the uh, the the Arrowverse crossover? Yes. Was, yes. Of, okay. Okay. I was yeah. so happy to see her again, and I'm like, wait a minute, you gave me her back. And then you did that? <laughs> That's uncalled for. Oh. I mean, couldn't we have her hanging around <coughs> that woman? 
That's a good. That's a good idea. Or or Star Girl. Yeah. Because you know Earth Two, how on the way right? Earth Two? Get it? You know, like hey, why, they're, they're, why, they're, look, the CW doesn't pay me, <laughs> and yet I'm the one thinking of this crap. Like, come on, man. <laughs> That's that's a good point. So. Give me one of my multiverse wives back, damn it. <laughs> okay. You know what I want. I'm gonna go full Batista now. <laughs> so do we we do we want to rate these two issues together or by issue? We can, What's do your it by, we can do it by issue if you want. I mean, why not? Okay, I'm gonna go for this issue. I'm gonna go story five and art four point five. It, this was an excellent issue. I actually enjoyed the Batman issues a little bit more than the Superman issues, which is a little unusual for me because I usually like Superman better as a character. So, Interesting. Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, didn't ex I really like where they're going with this. I, I, I love the story. Um, I just love the detective work that's happening here. Like, This book is living up to the title where yeah. you know 90% of it is Batman being a detective. Yeah. So I give it a five. Also because I didn't expect the, <clears throat> the reveal at the end with the zombie Sarah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for the art, look, those pages, those pages of Batman in the sewer alone. Wow, yeah. Are, were, were phenomenal. <clears throat> and, you know, the, the scene, the extension of that when the cops were chasing him through the sewer. Mm -hmm. That gave such year one vibes to me, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, my, that's my jam. So I'm going to give it a five. It's a perfect issue for me. Like I said, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. As I did the next issue. Yeah. Issue 1036. Mm -hmm. And we see that the zombie Sarah Worth that we were talking about actually turns out to be a disoriented lady Clayface. Yeah. Now I don't. She didn't say Sandra Fuller, right? She never actually not said that I, her. Not that I saw. Okay. Her. Okay. But she <laughs> references her. Who it is? But yeah. Yeah. She references herself as Lady Clayface. Right. And Batman and Huntress cross paths, investigating these multiple incidents of rage that are happening across Gotham. The rage murders. Yes, the rage murders. Yes. That's what I call them. Yeah. Now they also we see the events of A Day are referenced, and um, in Intra in Infinite Frontier Zero, Lady Clayface we see that she slunk away from Arkham, and uh, I'm a little out of place there. Excuse me. We see A Day reference, uh, and that was in Infinite Frontier Zero. In this issue, we see Lady Clayface. She slinks away from Arkham, unable to take human form, and she apparently. She either sees or just hears Sarah's murder in the sewer. Yeah. So that was an interesting visual. It, it certainly was. Um, but I also like the fact, what I really liked about this issue was the back and forth between Batman and Huntress. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, she... And, you know, Batman's like, at one point, he's like, you wait, you actually think I, because Batman is now, because of his confrontation with the police, he's being, sus, you know, kind of suspected yeah. of having some sort of involvement in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then later on, we see that Bruce Wayne is, not, is also uh, a suspect. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because he... He brought Sarah into into his house, his home, and right. one of the neighbors. See, this is the problem when you don't live at Wayne Manor anymore. You got nosy neighbors who don't mind their own goddamn business, and this is the problem. <laughs> anyway, so one of the and neighbors, <laughs> that was quite the visual hiding Clayface in the bag. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's like, I mean, put him in the closet. Uh, couldn't he put her in the closet? No, no, he's <laughs> shove her in the bag. <laughs> See, this is why Bruce needs Alfred. Because right. if, if it's not for Alfred, he puts everything into one bag. Right. Um, <laughs> but so Bruce becomes a suspect. And, and so at one point, Batman asks Huntress, Did you actually think I did it? And she's like, Well, no, but, you know. So the bat, and, and I like, 
when she's like, I'm a better shot. There's one point where Batman turns around and Huntress is facing her with the, with the crossbow. Yeah. And she's like, I'm a better shot than you. He's like, uh, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> he's like, yeah, he's no, just, I doubt that. He's just like, no, uh, absolutely not. That's basically. Um, and I like the part about how in the sewer when they're chasing Lady Clayface, he's like, come with me, I'll take you somewhere safe. And she's like, uh, the Huntress is like, you might want to, like, her reaction was like, that's not appropriate. You might want to phrase that differently, you know. <laughs> that kind of banter was kind of yeah. fun to me. Um, and then when the police interrogate, like, uh, <clears throat> go uh, searching Bruce Wayne's house, they're very polite about it, right? Mm-hmm. They're very, you know, would you let us in? And she's like, well, you're not going to, you, you're not going to break the, the neighbor who brought them there is like, you're not going to break down the door? Oh, so when rich people commit a crime, you do this is how you do things, you know. So <laughs> commenting on the on the the way, you know, police behavior towards different, um, like classes of people, economic yeah, classes, right. yeah. And I I like that because you're dealing with a real world issue without, you know, beating it down our throat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It was very, very skillfully done. Yeah, I also like Bruce's explanation. When they said, you know, somebody said that there was a scream, and he was like, "Oh, I was watching a horror movie." Yeah, <laughs> thought that he's, was good. He's so. very adept at, at, you know, cover stories. Yes, very, you know, very, you know, kind of uh, a yeah. neurologically nimble is Bruce. Yeah, Wayne, oh, that's so. a very good way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we see that while Mister Worth is still threatening everyone across Gotham oh, yeah. about his daughter's murder case, he thinks it should go faster. We see that the Penguin is operating from the shadows. And he comes across Neil Betterman, the assistant to Mayor Nakano, who is, and again, I'm talking about Neil here, he's suffering from the rage that we saw in the last issues, but we see these kind of like pink tentacles coming out of his eyes. So that is kind of, you know, I guess the manifestation of whatever is going on here. It's like the supernatural version of pink eye. (laughs) That's a good one. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, kind of gruesome and unsettling. That was yeah. what it was supposed to be, so. Yeah. Uh, there are small, with Lady Clayface and, and you know, the way the chemical, re- caught, caught mm-hmm. the, 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 the basically the physical manifestation of the rage on the face, there are horror elements to the mm-hmm. art here. Yes. Uh, and it's very well done. Yes. So, towards the end of this issue, we see Huntress... She tracks down Mary Knox's ex-boyfriend, who she thinks may have killed her, but he was actually on a plane when Mary was murdered. So then Huntress has Oracle put this him away. This is the backup for, story now. Right, yeah. this is the backup story. She puts him away for credit card fraud because he was using Mary's credit cards. However, he is not the killer of Mary, and so the search continues. Right. I just like the way she went after him, like full, like just... She laid into him. Like. Well, he didn't kill Mary, but he was not a nice guy. This, you know, he had physically assaulted Mary on right. many occasions. We see that in the story, and, so. I, and I like that the, the 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 way like like she took him out pretty good, and like she threatened him just enough. Yeah. Well, see, I don't. I see. I think the difference between Huntress and Batman is, I think, if pushed far enough, Huntress would have killed that guy. Under like the right he, circumstances, sure. Had he yeah. admitted that he killed Mary, I think he would have been dead. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, in certain circumstances and certain characters, depending on the character, again, I wouldn't. I wouldn't criticize her. No, I mean, again, this was this was somebody who had regularly beat his girlfriend, so yeah. it's not. It's a character who didn't elicit a lot of sympathy for right, exactly, in any right. way, shape, or form. And, and, so, and I just—it was really heartbreaking at the end when you see Huntress you taking care of the cat, you know. Right. There's that sense of loneliness again for Huntress. She lost mm-hmm. the rare friend that she makes. I think, you know, because aside from this Mary person, the only person we really see Huntress hang around are Barbara Gordon and and. Uh, and Cassandra Cain and, and the Birds of Prey and, and those people. So, you know, it's work-related kind of kind of friendship, if you will. This is kind of and this. This is, again, it's it's really Huntress is a, a, quite a, 
a tragic character. Uh -huh. and, and she works. She works well for this type of story. Yeah, and I also like the fact that she's Italian. In the character. It's, it's, it's part of the bad family. She's got good things going for her. <laughs> What's her, what's her favorite Italian dish? Is what I want to come on. The writer's gonna come. <laughs> is it lasagna? Is it gnocchi? What is? What are we? What are we, what are we working with here? Let's see. But uh, no, this is a really good. Like maybe, I said, maybe Bruce can buy her some at the end of this arc. So yeah, we'll see. Um, but I like that she's having a more prominent role, and I like the, the use of the bad family here. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like to see them, you know, inter. Like, of course, you want the book. You know, Batman is the star. But when you have so many good bad family characters, you like to see them sprinkled in like this. And I like the, you know, the balance of good point. Batman and Huntress, you know, sharing the spotlight. I, I really like it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so what do you want to rate this issue, sir? Again, I, I think it progresses the main story and the backup story quite nicely. Uh, you know, it takes things a step further. Uh, the mystery deepens because, again... Who is killing these women? We still don't know. Um, uh, I, I remember from the first time we reviewed Detective, it was a white-haired gentleman. Uh, it'd be interesting to see as before, but I'm I'm loving this mystery. Uh, Likewise, yeah. And yeah. so the story is a five, and I just can't get over it. this art is spectacular. Um, uh, so I'm going to give it a five as well. To me, this is, uh, of the two main Batman books, this is the, the preeminent Batman book. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go five and five, too. It was even better than the last issue, which was magnificent. So Yeah. yeah. So Detective is firing on all cylinders from the first issue to the last. Yeah. Ah! <laughs> all right. <laughs> and you can hear more wonderful puns like that. <laughs> right here on the Multiverse Musings vidcast, also available on iTunes and Podbean. You know, you think after I don't know how many episodes I would run out of ways to do that, but here we are. Hey, that's what makes this fun. Yeah. So, shall we go on then? Shall we go from the gutters of Gotham to the skies of action comics? How about that? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Yes, let's go to Metropolis with Action yeah. Comics number 1030. Mm -hmm. Now, this issue opens up with a mysterious figure coming to War World. Yeah. And he comes into the throne room of Mongol, and he actually has a bag that contains the heads of Mongol's sons. Well, that's and, a great way to start your Wednesday. Right. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that is, uh, that's quite, that, that'll wake you up in the morning. Yeah. And not not you know uh, not surprising. Mongol actually likes this. Mongol gets up and said, "You know what? You just save me the trouble of maybe having to put down you know uh, my sons who may want to usurp my power. So thank you for that gift." Um, Mongol he is he is a really messed up cat. Father of the year material right there, folks. I tell you, <laughs> there you know oh boy. <laughs> so. But even beyond that, we see that this, this mysterious stranger tells Mongol, he says, War World isn't what you think it is. There's a secret to it. And it is somehow tied to Superman. And this cloaked stranger wants to help Mongol understand what War World is. So that's a pretty deep mystery right there. Yeah, it sets up a mystery right off the bat, but also what it does is starting on War World mm -hmm. really gives you an idea of the scope that we're going to be in for for this yes. story, which, which yes. I really like. Like It yes. sets the stage quite well. Mm -hmm. So we see on Earth, Batman and the Atom are monitoring Superman as as he you know goes out and flies and exerts himself. Yeah, he's testing power. his powers, yeah. Yes. And Batman suggests that Superman has cellular decay. Now, we're starting to see this story play out of eventually John replacing Superman. And Batman says that the cellular decay may have been caused by radiation poisoning from Superman's battle with the, the giant green creatures from the breach. Right, which we covered. Right. Uh, yeah. 
which I thought may be constructs originally from the Green Lantern Corps, but I was wrong. Well, I knew you'd make that leap at some point, yeah. Now, in another scene, we see that John Kent is talking to Damien, and we see that John has future knowledge from the Legion of Superheroes, Mm. that he believes that this is the point in history where his father is close to death. Yes. And obviously, he is very distraught about that. That's so, a very different contrast between the father-son relationship <laughs> on the world and the bad. Yeah, exactly. Nice contrast there. <laughs> I gotta say, I really enjoy the um, the, the friendship between uh, John and Damien. Magnificent dialogue there, I gotta um, say. Yeah. Um, and it really does echo and mirror the relationship between Batman and Superman. Like, if you go back and say, if you go back and look at what, after those tests, you know, the Adam is trying to sugarcoat, well, you know, we're still okay, no, no need to really worry. Batman's like, you might be dying. <laughs> you know? Yeah, Batman's giving it to him straight. You know, Batman doesn't sugarcoat. And it's like, prepare John to take over your role and to be the leader of the Justice League. And then in, in, uh, later on in the story, you have, you know, John is like, well, you know, I'm really worried about my father and, and I, I'm not ready to be Superman. He's like, well, and, and David is like, well, I'm sorry you're feeling, you know, bad about your father, but you really have no choice in the matter. You're taking <laughs> over your father whether you like it or not. Yeah. It really not, does, you know, mirror each other, the, the relationships. That, yeah, that that's a good point. Um, Excellent. And I also, I got a shout out to the, when Superman was battling those drones, mm-hmm. the art, My God, by Daniel uh, Sampare, I think is how you pronounce it. Yes. Because yes. I don't think we gave the art credit, the, the credits, Donnie. Oh, uh, yeah, I got to go. I got to do that, don't I? Uh, okay. Yeah. Once again, I will do my best here. <laughs> okay. The art team, Philip Kennedy Johnson, writer, Daniel Sampare, the artist, Adrian or Adriano. I'm not sure what the font is here, but Adrian Lucas, the colorist, and Dave Sharp, the letterer. So, so the art there, yeah, I mean, in that scene, it was just magnificent. Yeah. I'll just say, throughout the whole book, the art is magnificent. I mean, the background of War World and Adriano Lucas, the, the color is magnificent. Absolutely. It's so See, vibrant. So, yeah, very vibrant. Like it just it, seeps through the page. Yeah, it's you like, can, you can like yeah. feel the heat of it. It's you can awesome. almost touch the, 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 the you're engulfed in the color of the, of the yeah. thing. But just the way he draws, like Daniel draws Superman, mm-hmm. it's this modern yet classic look to it. And I, it's perfect. I think this is one of the perfect renditions of Superman. I definitely agree. I definitely like the art there. So... This story, and by the way, there's a backup story to this that Adam and I agreed not to cover because it doesn't yeah, have anything to do with... It has nothing to do with... with, with yeah. yeah. So this story ends with a group of spacecrafts appear on Earth, and they're actually carrying Kryptonian refugees. Mm. Or at least that's what this group of people say they are. Yeah. So here's a, the big mystery. What's going on here? So, and again, I, I was not expecting to... be introduced to Kryptonian refugees. Like, that was the last thing on my mind. Mm -hmm. Because, like, I knew there were some Kandorians at one point housed in the Bottle City because, you know, that years back, remember when the Krypton, there was a story in Superman where there was, like, uh, 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 thousands of Kryptonians that Oh yeah, the bottle city of Candor, right? Then right. and I'd come to her, and and until he could find a way to sort of find a place for them, Superman begrudgingly put them back into the thing and promised mm-hmm. to, at some point, bring them back out. Uh, but that got destroyed. So I thought, okay, it's back to just him, Supergirl, and kind of sort of John because he's half Kryptonian, mm-hmm. as the only Kryptonians. And Connor, because he's a clone, right. as the only sort of what is that four, four 
How many Kryptonians is that? Four, yeah. Right. And Crypto is five. So five, I thought there was like five left. And, but apparently not, there's more. And I was, when, when that, I, I gotta be honest with you, when I first read that, the month it came out, and that page hit, I was like, I want the next issue right now. Right. <laughs> and, I, and of course, I had to wait a month, which sucked. Right. Uh, right. But that's a good feel. When a book leaves you like that, that's exactly what you want. Like I said, even though I like the Batman issues a little bit better, I still really enjoyed this. So, so what would you... be your final thought? And uh, I jumped in there. Your okay. final thought <laughs> and your baby. So, uh, like you, I enjoyed it greatly. I'm going to give the story a four. I'm going to give the art a four point five. Like I said, I really like this a lot. Like you, I couldn't wait for the next issue. So, all right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and just blurt it out right now. I've been reading Superman and Action Comics steady since about 2003. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, this is the best issue, single issue of Action Comics that I've read. That's some high praise. Wow. In that time period. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, I loved it. I love the things it set up. I love the mystery. I love the scope right off the bat with War World. Uh, the weird relationship between the father and sons on War World. The, the, the dichotomy of the relationship between fathers and the, the father and son in John and Superman. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the parallels between Batman and Superman relationship with John and, and, and Damien's relationship. It all just worked so beautifully for me. And that opening, the first few scenes with Superman and, and, and Lois at mm -hmm. the, like using that technology in the fortress. Yes. yes. That could be, it's like VR that, that allowed Lois to experience Kandor. Just the banter between Superman, uh, Superman and, well, I'll call him Clark because he is Clark. Clark and Lois in those scenes was like top tier. I'm going to go ahead. I rarely do this first issues of a run. But I'm going to give it a five for story and a five for art. Excellent, I loved it. Yeah. I was in love with it. Yeah. Well, I can tell. So why don't we go on to the next issue, yeah. issue 1031. You were tempted to say issue two, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so we see that the war zooms from War World. I'll say that five times real fast. Yeah, I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm glad I got through that one. And they have actually followed these refugee characters. Now, Superman and Superboy are able to kind of turn them back and res rescue the refugees. Mm. But we see that Atlantis actually captures a fragment of the ship, like the power source. Yes. And they actually refer to it as the source. It's an unknown element. They're not sure exactly what it is. Do you so, think that has something to do with the source wall? Well, that was that was my wondering too. I was like, is this some kind of, you know, beyond just, you know, some kind of like biological element? Is this something that, you know, has some kind of mystical quality to it as well? Mm -hmm. So again, Atlantis, they keep that fragment. They also have some of the war zoom prisoners. That was my favorite part, I think, of this of Superman attempting to go in the cell, whatever yeah. you call that cell in uh, Atlantis, and talk to the war zoons, and one of them attacks him, and Superman just kind of stands there while, you know, the character, you know, blood is his hand on Superman, and he tries to headbutt him, and he, and he you know, bashes his own skull. And I like those kind of moments with Superman to remind you that he doesn't always need to go fist and fury. He's pretty much invulnerable, yeah, even in this state. Yeah. He's not, what I love about it is that he's not, you know, punch first, ask questions later. Mm. He's actively trying. I don't want to fight you. I just want to talk this up. Right. And again, he hasn't met these people before. This is his first in interaction with them. Why would his first instinct be, let me beat the crap out of you? Right. Being Superman and who Superman is, I'd expect Superman to say, I'm not, I don't want to hurt you. Can we talk this through? Mm -hmm. You know? 
Like, that he, he, is... he even tries to unshackle the, the big prisoner. He's like, yeah, he he's like why, are you guys, why are these guys in chains? They don't need it. And then the, and the alliance is like, no, 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 no. We, we tried. They wanted them back on. We didn't want to leave. <laughs> they really are different from War World, aren't they? So. But going, going back, I really wanted to just talk about how. Go ahead. A couple, two things. <clears throat> Seeing John and Superman work together. To take down those, what were they called? War zooms? War zooms, yes. Yeah. Um, I, it's just a beautiful sight when I see like, the two of them working together. And the art, like to, to display that, is so beautiful. It's like a combination. When you see Superman and John doing things mm. in tandem like that, there's an element of beauty and power to it, given in the, in, in the way the art, you know. Evokes that evokes these rescues mm -hmm. that just work so well together. Yeah. So uh, it'll be after Father's Day by the time you see this. But hey, get your father a belated Father's Day gift. Go out and buy these issues for him. By the way, Happy Father's Day. Uh, well, thank you, sir. Yes. Um, I may have kids in the multiverse that I am unaware of, but in this universe, I don't, so I can't. <laughs> um, but uh, <clears throat> the uh, <clears throat> and if <clears throat> and if I do, and somehow they cross over. Don't come looking to me for money because that's his problem, not mine. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, the uh, I, I won't pick up the slack for an alternate version of me. It's not my problem. Uh, <laughs> if I don't get to enjoy the process of making these kids, then it's not my problem. Um, but um, the uh, the other aspect uh, of it I liked was when this is a weird podcast, man. Yeah, really, well, at, least we're not talking, at least we didn't go into detail about Batman's preferences. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Um, but a lot anyway, more tasteful than that. Ugh. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but mm. um, the part I really liked about it was the, the Atlantean sequence when they're talking to Superman about the source. Mm -hmm. And Superman's like, well, can I take it back to the fortress to analyze it? You know, like Superman's very respectful of yeah. this is a sovereign kingdom. You know, I'm doing things the right way. And they're like, respectfully, no, you're not taking this anywhere. No, no. <laughs> it's a lot of property. The only reason you're getting to even see it is because of courtesy because of who you are in, in relation to Aquaman. Right. That, that's the only way, that, that's the only reason they're even tolerating Superman. Yeah. And I just love that, the way that bantered back and forth. Yeah. That, yeah, that was really, yeah. And you could, you could tell the, the Atlanteans just loathed the war zones. <laughs> And they're all earthlings. They're like, with these fish. <laughs> Why does all their crap have to come in our... In our in our... <laughs> yeah, surface dwellers again. Yeah. <laughs> We're not your toilet, Dan. Keep your, keep your shit up there. <laughs> Send it down here. So back to the story, we see that Supergirl and John are trying to figure out how there are Kryptonian refugees alive. Yeah. And we actually see Supergirl reference the fact that they're speaking a dead... <laughs> Kryptonian language. Yeah. Something that hadn't been spoken for thousands of years. Right. And near the end of this story, we see that the refugees are actually kind of plants by Mongol. And we see Mongol torturing them back on War World. And we see the cloaked figure there. This seems to be part of this plan to discover this big mystery by Mongol. Right. So there's uh, a lot, lot of questions left unanswered here. I, I love that scene because it gives you some glimpse into what happens to these people. But mm -hmm. just help me understand something because I was a little bit confused. Okay, um, I'll do my best. Um, but the so when. When he was putting the branding on, you know, the the the, the, the symbol, the Superman symbol, the, right. the House of El symbol, on these refugees, was he doing that because they were calling out for Superman? I'm not exactly sure what they were trying. I think it was to create some kind of like familiarity, maybe with Superman and the Kryptonian culture. So are, like, they, are they actually Kryptonian refugees? Because, or is he doing that? I, I don't think we know that yet. Okay, because I was I'm like, is he doing this on purpose to lure Superman into some sort of trap? Are they actually Kryptonians? What's going on? I'm, I'm very confused. Right. Yeah, and in I, good, again... In a good way. Right. I, I don't think we're supposed to know those answers yet. Right. 
So okay. yeah, and I I find this very intriguing, much like the you know the Batman mystery we talked about. So yeah. yeah, what is Mongol up to exactly? What is he after? And who is this like cloaked stranger that all of a sudden makes his way to War World with you know a, a <clears throat> bag full of heads? So right, and and I like that. I also love the just seeing the super family. Like so, you have Superman, John, uh, Supergirl, even Lois thrown in there. Like them having that back and forth conversation, trying to work it out, you know, work this mystery out. Mm -hmm. It's such so refreshing to see, because I think, you know, up until I would say probably, I think what I'm what I'm seeing from this early stage of the of the Infinity or Infinite Frontier era is an emphasis on the family dynamic of these characters, these franchises, That's a good the point. legacy that, and. We're seeing it play out more, more so than before. I think I haven't seen this kind of like super family, bad family dynamic mm -hmm. yeah. since I've been reading, you know, steadily. Yeah. And I like it. I'm here for it. Right. No, I agree totally. Um, yep. So, what would you rate this issue? Uh, just. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but just because of my confusion over what's going on with with refugees and and mm -hmm. and, um, and um, uh, Mongol, I'm going to say four point five for story. Okay. And the art is again, it's a five. I mean, yeah, it's perfect. The art yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah, I'm I'm actually going to mirror those too. I'm going to say story four point five, art five. So awesome. And yeah. we of course. We'll continue reviewing these stories uh, on future episodes of the DC Comics Chronicles. We'll probably do two at a time uh, for each each story. Um, so uh, we will continue going through those with you, and we will find out the answers of both mysteries together. But until we get more answers in subsequent issues, if you want to keep talking about these comics or the movies that they inspire or the TV series or any other geek-related uh, franchise that we podcast about on this network, you can on social media. So, Donnie, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter as the Emerald Enthusiast. Let's talk pro wrestling. Let's talk collectibles. Let's talk comics. Let's talk Green Lantern. Fantastic. And if you want to track me down, you can at Adam underscore least fan on Twitter. Um... You can um, uh, also follow the um, Twitter page for the, uh, the podcast network, at MMNPDC. We also have a Facebook page, which is linked below. Click it, and I will add you to the group, and we can continue the conversation there. <clears throat> but until next time, remember that DC Comics and Action and Detective Comics are forever despite the first dc <laughs> shipping issue to my local comic book shop to the last so long everybody so long everyone <laughs>